I shared a story about me riding my bike. Do you guys remember that story? If you don't remember the story, go back on YouTube. We have all of our sermons up on YouTube, cy.abq, and uh, go watch part one of this sermon series, because that's where I told the story. But essentially, I'm riding my bike as God has asked me to. I'm riding it as much as I can. I'm, I'm riding it on the way home. And I realize that there's a storm happening on my bike ride home. Yeah, I don't know if you've ridden your bike recently. You're open to the rain. You're open to the elements. You're going to get poured on. And I turn around, and I'm riding my bike. I'm like, God, I'm going to go. I'm going to ride my bike. And I look up towards the mountains, and the mountains are gone. They're completely gone. They're just covered in a dark cloud. And I'm like, wow, that's so crazy, because that's where I'm going. That's where I'm riding my bike. God, are you sure you still want me to ride my bike? And I hear the Lord just speak to me quietly in my heart. He says, I know it looks crazy, Santi, but will you go anyway? And as we've been talking through this series, Walk It Out, we've kind of made this analogy that, that sometimes our relationship with Jesus looks like him calling us by name saying, come on this hike with me. Come up this mountain. I'm going to lead you along this crazy life called being a Christian and following Jesus. And he asks you to go on this hike. And sometimes as you're walking towards the mountain, as you're walking to do the thing that Jesus has asked you to do, you realize that it's covered in a cloud. And you don't really know what's going to happen. But God asks you the question, Will you go anyway? You see, at some point in your walk with Jesus, you might face some sort of temptation. Maybe it's a temptation to sin. Maybe it's a temptation to just not spend as much time with him. Maybe you experience a doubt. Oh my gosh, I, I didn't think about it that way. I, oh, what am I supposed to believe about Jesus? And you start having this kind of crisis about your faith with Jesus. And you're on your hike and you're faced with, do I go this way or do I go that way? And Jesus asks you the question, I know that you have all these doubts. I know that you have this temptation. I know you're going through this thing. But will you still follow me anyway? My hope is that this series is going to prepare you with some things that you need for when you hit that moment, you, you're armored up. You've got the right tools. You've got everything you need to say, you know what, Jesus? It seems a bit crazy, but I, I am going to go anyway. So on our hike with Jesus, the first step is, and they're going to be on the screen, the first step that we learned is that you're only going to go if you know his voice. You need to learn how to be a really good listener. You need to learn how to listen to his voice so that way you know if he's actually calling you somewhere or not. The second step that we learned, we learned this last week, it's that you'll only go if you know how to run. And it's learning how to be someone who runs towards obedience with Jesus. You don't sit and think about it and wait for Satan to say whatever he wants to you and, and then you're even more tempted. No, no, no. As soon as God asks you to do something, you're somebody who runs towards him. And this week, as we're in part three of this sermon, we're learning that you'll only go if you know he is good. If we're going to follow Jesus where he asks us to go, we need to learn how to be people who can focus on his goodness. Turn to the person next to you. Say, focus, focus. on his goodness. Turn to the person on the other side. Say, focus, even louder. Focus. Focus. On his goodness. We've been going through a passage in John chapter 10. And today, we're finally getting to kind of the end of one of Jesus' thoughts. And we're going to be re reading verses 10 and 11. So if you'd read with me. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Say rich and satisfying. Jesus talking, I am the good shepherd. 
The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Jesus, thank you so much what we've been learning from this passage. I really feel like you've just been speaking to us, Lord. I feel like you've been speaking to me as I'm learning and teaching through this, Father. You've just shown me so much. And this week, I'm so thankful that you're showing us that you're the good shepherd. You're not some random shepherd, a thief who's trying to steal us away from you and and lead us to pastures that are actually bad for us. No, Jesus, as we're sheep and we're following you, you are such a good shepherd. You want us to have a rich and a satisfying life following you. Jesus, I pray that we would learn to trust that you are good. I pray that we would learn to trust your voice and know that you want the best for us. You're not trying to take things from us. You're actually trying to give us the best thing possible. So just be with us as we learn tonight and help us to see that you truly are the good shepherd. We love you, Jesus. Speak to us tonight. In your name, amen. I love reading this passage because it kind of shares something that people don't really think about when they think about Christianity. People who aren't Christians, people who kind of live in the outside world, when they look on what we're doing, they see a lot of people who just have a lot of rules to follow and they can't do fun things and they actually live a really boring life. But in this whole series, we've actually been finding out that living a life for Jesus can actually be quite exhilarating and exciting and actually more exciting than some of the stuff that happens out there. And I love this passage specifically because when people kind of talk about Jesus and they say that he's a Debbie Downer and he says, oh, those Christians, they don't, they just want people to be down in the dumps all the time. I can literally point to this passage And I can say, really, Jesus, God who came down in human flesh, he said that what he wants for every single person in this room, every single person out there, every single person that you come in contact with, what he wants for them is he wants a rich and a satisfying and a fulfilling life. I love another uh, version. I forget which version it is, but it says that Jesus came to bring us life and he came to bring us life to the full. Everyone is really looking for a satisfying life. Some people might be looking for it in comfort. Some people might be looking for it in popularity. Some people might be looking for it in good grades or just like having a good family life. But what every single person is looking for in life is to wake up in the morning and to be excited about the life that they're living. They want purpose. They want a reason to get out of bed. They want a reason to go and do something. And the world will tell you a bunch of different ways that you can go and do that. But what Jesus says here and what we find is the actual truth from the God who created us in the first place is that if we follow him, if we do what he asks, that we will have a rich and satisfying life. I love this passage because when people ask what Christianity is actually about, I can point to this and I can say, Jesus gave up a lot so that way you could have everything that you need. This is why he's the good shepherd. Another shepherd might take you away and and they'll promise that it's going to be a good life, but in the end, it doesn't actually work out. But when we follow Jesus, the good shepherd, when we finally follow him all the way through life and we get to heaven, we read in the book of Psalms, it says that in the presence of God is the fullness of joy. And we have everything that we need. Jesus is the good shepherd. In verse 11, he says not only that he is the good shepherd, but he starts saying what the good shepherd does. He says the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. And this is kind of a crazy thing for Jesus to say. Because the people that he's talking to in this passage, 
Uh, they're called the Pharisees. You guys might have heard of the Pharisees before. If you've been in here, I've talked about them before. But they're kind of like the religious elite people. They would be like the pastors of the time. But they were really bad pastors. They weren't good pastors. They didn't care about the people that they were shepherding. They only cared about themselves. And they thought the way to a rich and a satisfying life was to look better than everyone else, was to follow a bunch of rules and be perfect. They thought that the way to a rich and satisfying life was to turn to the person next to them and start shaming them and guilting them and telling them that they're not enough. So these people who are shepherds, they would never give up their life for the sheep. But yet we hear Jesus, God in human flesh, the good shepherd, say that a good shepherd sacrifices himself for his sheep. Israel was not used to good shepherds. In Ezekiel 34, these are the kinds of people that were leading them. These were the pastors of the time. It says in Ezekiel 34, Then this message came from the Lord. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds, the leaders of Israel. Give them this message from the sovereign Lord. What sorrow awaits you shepherds who feed yourselves instead of your flocks? Shouldn't shepherds feed their sheep? You drink the milk, wear the wool, and butcher the best animals, but you let your flocks starve. You have not taken care of the weak. You have not tended the sick or bound up the injured. You have not gone looking for those who have wandered away and are lost. Instead, you have ruled them with harshness and cruelty. So my sheep have been scattered without a shepherd, and they are easy prey for a wild animal. They have wandered through all the mountains and all the hills across the face of the earth, yet no one has gone to search for them. Jumping down to verse 10. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I now consider these shepherds my enemies, and I will hold them responsible for what happened to my flock. I will take away their right to feed the flock, and I will stop them from feeding themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths. The sheep will no longer be their prey. You see, the people that were taking care of the Israelites just took a lot of things for themselves and let the people starve. The shepherds that Israel has experienced in the past did everything for themselves and let all of the sheep die. And Jesus gets really angry at this. And God gets so angry at this because he told these shepherds to take care of his sheep. He says, if they're not going to do it right, then I'll do it myself. And 600 years after this was written in Ezekiel, Jesus steps on the scene. God in human flesh. And he says himself, he says, you know that shepherd that was supposed to come in and do more than all of the bad shepherds could ever do? That's me. And Jesus steps on the scene and says, a good shepherd, the person that you should follow, is not going to take everything for himself, but he will even lay down his life for you. Who are you following? Are you following a movement? Are you following an Instagram? Or are you following a YouTuber that really just wants you to do something for them so that way they can get rich and get everything they want? I think of people like Mr. Beast. Bro, people loved him. People were like, oh, Mr. Beast is the reason that I can believe good things happen in this world. And then all this stuff comes out that even though he was pretending to be nice, he was pretending to give money to people, he was actually a really messed up guy. He was really trying to take things for himself. Jesus is not this way. Maybe the only example of shepherds that you've been given in your life are really bad shepherds. I know it can be hard to talk about in church, but it's genuinely happening to people. Maybe some people have parents in here who are not really taking care of them. Maybe you have teachers in school that are really putting you down every single day so that way they can feel better about themselves. Maybe some of you in here have leaders of their group of friends, right? They're like the clique, they're like the cool people, and there's one person leading it. And they have done nothing for you 
and they are taking everything for themselves. Maybe you have only been, giving, been given examples of shepherds that take. I'm here to tell you that Jesus is not this way. You see, bad shepherds demand that you give something up so that way they can have more. But a good shepherd says, I will give you everything so that way you can have what you need. As I read this book and we talk about walking up this mountain, following Jesus, the Bible is not about what you have to give up to get to God. Turn to someone next to you and say, the Bible is not about what you have to give up to get to God. Here's what it is about. The Bible is about what God gave up to get you. You see, in verse 11, Jesus is foreshadowing what he was going to do. He said, I am the good shepherd. I'm going to lead you. And to show you how good I am, I'm going to go to a cross and I'm going to die for you so that way you can be in heaven with me forever. Jesus is not demanding that you give up like so much just to get to him. In fact, God said, I am going to come down from heaven and I am going to give everything so that way I can get you. Because if Jesus did not die on the cross, we would still be stuck in sin. We wouldn't be able to be in heaven with him. Maybe you're having a hard time looking at Jesus as a good person because all of the shepherds in your life have wanted to take things from you instead of give to you. Maybe you've even had a pastor in your life at a different church or somewhere and all they wanted to do was take from you. You said, you're not very much like Jesus. I don't know if I can believe in this guy. We need to be careful that we don't let a human being who is messed up and is not a good shepherd shape our view of Jesus, the good shepherd. Every single human being is still stuck in sin, even when we're saved. Even me as a pastor, I am not a perfect person. But when we look to Jesus and we see the perfect person, God in human flesh, and we see what he did for us, and we see that he died for us, it forever stands as a reminder of how good he is. In Romans 8.32, it says this. It says, Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? So God asks you to do something. He says, Hey, my little sheep, it's time to go to a different pasture. And you get to the gate, and you start looking in the pasture, and you're like, This one doesn't look as fun as the last one. This one does not look as exciting. (laughs) Am I supposed to go? The temptation for us is to start thinking that God is not good and that he forgot about us and that because he's moving us to a different pasture that he must not care about us anymore. But all you need to do in this moment is look all the way in the past and look at what Jesus has already done for you and you get to see that he cares about you so much you can trust what lies in front of you. He must have a plan that you can't see. He must have something that you're not aware of. For Jesus, it wasn't enough for him to just say that he loved us. He said, I'm going to show you I'm going to die on a cross. As a historical fact, even historians who are not Christians will say that there is a man named Jesus, that he died on a cross and had this following. And there are eyewitnesses accounts that three days later, people met him and he revealed himself to them. This historical moment in time where the God of the universe died for you stands for all of us as a memory that he loves you and he cares for you. You don't have to be scared of what God's asking you to do. You don't have to be scared of being obedient to God. If he was willing to die for you, 
man, what else won't he give you? Won't he give you everything you need, even if you don't see it? So when you're faced with, will I go? You need to look at what's happened in the past. You need to look at what he's already done for you so that way you can keep moving forward in the future. When he asks you to go, you need to remember where he has already gone. And it'll give you courage to get through the next season. Be someone who clings to his goodness. Someone who remembers his goodness. How often do you think about the cross? When we're singing worship songs and maybe you came in here and you're thinking about all the things that you've done wrong. I can't be a good Christian. Man, Jesus probably doesn't care about me anymore because of that thing I did, that thought I had, the friends I've been hanging out with. How often do you stop those thoughts and say, no, I remember what he did on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he already knew all of the things that I'd done. He already knew all the things that I was going to do and he still died anyway. You need to be someone who remembers the cross, remembers what he did. Why? Why do you need to keep the cross on your mind? Not just as a necklace, not just in your bio on TikTok or Instagram, not just on your hat. Why do you need to keep it as a memory of something that actually happened? Because there's another dude called the thief, his name is Satan, who will do anything in his power to make sure you forget what Jesus did for you. You see this word thief in verse 10. It says the thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy. This word thief, it's the Greek word. It's, it's called kleptis. Someone who steals things, you might have heard the word kleptomaniac. That's where it comes from. But what it means specifically is this. It means a criminal who typically relies on stealth to take property belonging to someone else. And the reason that it's so important that he used this word, this word kleptis, is because Satan's number one thing in your life that he is trying to do is to make sure that he is so secretive and sneaky that you don't even know how he's working. Satan has to lie and be sneaky because his real purpose and intention is to steal, to kill, and destroy you from God. Why would he tell you that? Would you, if someone told you, hey, listen, <clears throat> my intention, I just really want the worst life for you, actually. I, I'm planning on taking everything from you, um, just so you know. Uh, I, I kind of actually want to kill you. I don't really want you to have your life anymore. And, and I really just want to destroy everything you love. You want to come with me? No one's going to do that. You might make a joke about it and say, yeah, I'll do that. But if you were actually thinking about it, if he's being truthful, no one is going to go and follow that person. Satan has to be secretive in your life because if you knew what he was actually about, there is no way that you would ever even consider some of the things that he's asking you to do. But because he is sneaky, that's not what he does. He wants you to forget about God's goodness. And he doesn't always just come up and say, hey, bro, God's not, God's not very good. You shouldn't follow him. Like, he doesn't just come up to you and say that. He actually usually does this first. He usually puts something that he says is really good in your life first. He says, hey, what about this? You ever thought about doing this? Oh, I've noticed... Your God over there, he's asking you to go to a pastor. It doesn't look very fun. If you come with me, look at this pastor I'm going to take you to. There's flowers. There's dandelions. I've got a Bluetooth. There's music. We're going to have so much fun. Come over to this pastor. Your God, he's not good. He doesn't want the best for you. Why would you even think that? Look at where he's having you go. Come over here with me. He won't outright tell you that your God isn't good. He's going to paint a picture of what your life could be beforehand. What you don't know is that on the other side of the flowers and the dandelions and the Bluetooth speaker is a cliff that he's ready to just pitch you off of. Do 
Jesus doesn't operate this way. Jesus is pretty straight up with what he needs you to do. And he's actually even pretty straight up with his disciples about what's going to happen in his life. Remember the first week when we met outside, we had the campfire night? You guys remember that? Remember what I talked about? There was, a, there was a time when Peter, Jesus tells Peter what's happening in the future. And Peter's left at the moment. This doesn't look, what I, this doesn't look like what I thought it was. Am I going to follow him? Peter comes to his moment of, will I go anyway? Why is Peter here? Well, because the person he's been following, the person that he thought was going to set up this kingdom and rule on the earth forever, straight up tells him, hey, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be hung on a cross, and I'm going to die. Are you coming with me? You see, Jesus did not have to lie to his disciples and pretend like the pastor that they were walking to was going to be super cool. Why? Because he's not trying to like lie about where he's going to take you. Jesus is not trying to pull a fast one on you and like bait and switch you and say, ooh, if you become a Christian, look at how cool your life is going to be. And then you like, nothing changes and you're just still having a hard time. No, no, no. Jesus is not trying to do that. Jesus will be straight up with you. He was straight up with his disciples. Why? Because he knows that what you need is not a really good circumstance. What you need is to be walking with him. The thing that you need most in life in order to have a full and a rich life is to be spiritually completed by God. If the emptiness in your heart is filled up by Jesus, then it doesn't matter how many friends you have. It doesn't matter how much money you end up making. It doesn't matter. You could end up being rich. And it wouldn't matter because you already have everything that you need. The coolest thing about Jesus is that if you follow him, you will always have the very thing that you might feel like you're missing right now. And that is a relationship with him. That is his presence. And it doesn't matter what pastor you go to you'll have the richness of life. Jesus does not promise Christians an easy life. Sometimes we do. We're blessed in the U.S. We can gather here and talk about Jesus and we do have a good life. We're able to make money and we're able to go and enjoy the world that God created like we did on the hike today. But that's not promised. Not every Christian in the world has that. There are some Christians in the world who they literally can't even meet like this and talk about Jesus or they'll be killed. But when you watch videos of those people, when you watch videos of people who are being persecuted and they talk about Jesus, they don't wish that they didn't have the persecution because they have the good shepherd next to them giving them everything that they need. So as you're looking to the next pasture and you're hoping for a really good circumstance and then maybe Jesus doesn't tell you about the circumstance, I want you to know it doesn't matter what pasture you're in. It matters which person is with you. You see, with Jesus, the circumstance doesn't look ideal all the time. But don't worry, the person that you're walking through it with is. With Satan, the circumstance is ideal. But the person walking with you will push you over a cliff in a heartbeat. You see, when I was in middle school and, and in high school, I stopped believing that God was good. Satan really, he did, he did his work. And he made me believe that God didn't have the best in mind. And this is when I was walking away from Jesus and I wasn't a believer. This is what I thought was happening. I thought I had a blindfold on. I thought that everything my parents had been telling me, everything the church was telling me, was all this lie that was fabricated for me to not live in the real world. I thought I was a sheep who had the wool pulled over my eyes. And I thought that when I stopped believing in Jesus, when I started talking to my atheist friends and, and they cheered for me when I finally said I didn't believe in Jesus anymore, I thought that I was going like this. And I thought that I was taking the blindfold off of my face. And I thought that I was seeing the world for how it really was. 
Several years later, when my life fell apart because of what Satan had me doing, and Jesus finally brought me back to him, he made me realize this, is that I had not taken off a blindfold. I had put something else on instead. This is a VR headset. And it immerses you into a fake digital world that does not exist. But it looks like everything you want it to be. If you know how to make a video game, you can make this virtual world look like anything that you want it to be. And you can fake it and you can trick yourself into believing that it's real. And I thought that the world, Satan had showed me what the real world looked like. But actually what he was doing was feeding to my eyes the exact thing that I wanted to see. And as I'm wearing this, yeah, I can kind of see, right? There's like a camera on it. But I'm really scared that I'm going to fall off this edge. And as I was stumbling around in the dark of life without Jesus, I'm standing here and I'm looking over this cliff and Satan just kicks me in. When I finally took the VR headset off, when I finally stopped believing the lie that Satan was feeding me, I took it off. And what I saw in front of me was a man named Jesus. And he was there, hanging on a cross, saying, Santi, will you go? Will you follow me? I want to save you. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, Jesus, I've messed up so much. I haven't believed in you. I've believed this lie. I'm not a good person. Jesus, I grew up in the church. I shouldn't have been doing these things. What you still want, I can't follow you, Lord. I've messed up too bad. And he's hanging on the cross as a reminder of what he did for me. And he looks at me and he says, Will, I know all those things, Santi. I know all the things you've done. I know all the ways you've messed up. Will you go anyway? Will you follow me anyway? Because if you follow me, I will save you from that pit that Satan kicked you into. I will save your life and I will bring you up and I will give you the fullness of life that the good shepherd offers. And all it took for me was saying, yes, Jesus, I'm going to do that. Don't fall in love with the pasture that's in front of you. Because Satan might use it to lure you into a place you're never supposed to go. Fall in love with the good shepherd. The one that will give you good pastures and sometimes not so good pastures. And then sometimes great pastures again. But the entire time, you've had him. You've had the very thing you needed. Like that song says, I just want to be with you, Jesus. I just want to be in your presence. I don't care where I'm going as long as I have you. I don't care how this works, Jesus, as long as I have you. And the coolest thing about it is the more that you go with Jesus the more you start to know how good he is. You might be sitting here and you're faced with being obedient. Jesus is saying, come, I want you over here. Follow me. You're thinking, I'm scared. I don't want to do that. But when you decide to walk and follow him and be obedient, you find on the other side just how good he really is. See, obedience isn't an opportunity to show how good you are. Obedience is an opportunity to find out how good God is. Maybe you think being obedient, following Jesus, is all about the way that you look to other people, is all about the way that you look to God, and all about the way that you look to your family. And you think that if I mess up even a little bit, if I don't obey completely, then it's just all gone. 
But really what Jesus is calling you into when he calls you into obedience is saying, hey, will you find out how good I am? Will you say yes to me and will you find out how good I am? And the next time he tells you to pray for that person, the next time he asks you to go and do that thing, the next time he asks you to stand up for him, you'll do it and you'll find out what he has for you on the other side. Don't be scared to be obedient. The only thing you have, the only risk involved, is finding out how good Jesus is. So I went for it. Jesus is standing there. He's saying, Santi, I know how much you've messed up. I know what you've done. I know all the doubts you have. I know all the fears you have. Will you come and follow me anyway? And I was obedient. And I walked towards him. And I'm standing here today because of it. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus is really good. That even when he asks you to do something scary, when you find out on the other side, you find out he didn't let go of you the whole time. That when you're scared to give him your life, that when you do and you give up control to him, he's actually a really good shepherd. And he's actually really good at helping you find friends even better than you are. He's actually really good at helping piece your family together better than you are. That he's actually really good at helping you not sin in that way anymore better than you are. Let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes if we could get the lights down. I want everyone's eyes closed. I can see if your eyes are open. Close your eyes. Not for me, but to just get rid of distraction, to just be in the presence of Jesus. Close your eyes. Be in the presence of Jesus. Everybody, close your eyes. Be in the presence of Jesus. Jesus, you know everything that's going on in their heads. You know everything that they've done this week. You know everything they haven't done this week. But Father, I'm getting this sense right now that you're calling some of them. You're calling some of them by name. You're saying, will you follow me anyway? I know you're scared to to do the thing, but will you follow me? Do you trust that on the other side of stepping forward and praying to receive me, do you believe that I will change your life? Jesus, I pray that you would help them to know that that is exactly what you do want to do. Lord, you did that for me. I pray that you would do that for them. If you're in here and you feel a tug on your heart and everyone's going to keep their eyes closed, if you feel like there is a tug on your heart, Jesus is calling you. Maybe you grew up in the church, but you honestly haven't really been following him. You've said you're a Christian, but you really haven't been listening. You haven't been obeying. You haven't been looking at his goodness. You're you're just a Christian in name. Or maybe this is the first time you're hearing about how good Jesus is. And you feel something in your heart pulling you. Would you just stand up right now where you are? Everyone's eyes are closed. Just stand up right now where you are. Just stand up all over the room. I'm seeing people stand up. Not everybody, but if you want to give your life to Jesus, stand up and stay standing. Stay standing if you want to give your life to Jesus. He's calling you. He's a really, really good shepherd. And all you need to do is say, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. I believe you. I trust you. Any more people, stand up. Anyone else? Awesome. Right where you are, if you want to just pray this prayer after me, this is just you giving your life to Jesus. It says in Romans 8, not in Romans 8, it says in the book of Romans that if you confess with your heart, or if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you will be saved. And when you say that prayer and you genuinely say to Jesus, I want to follow you, you're one of his sheep. You've got a really good shepherd 
and he will take you where you need to be. So just repeat after me. Jesus, I give you my life. I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I want to follow you, Jesus. But it isn't always easy. Would you help me to live my life for you? Would you help me to listen to your voice? Would you help me to obey your commands? And would you help me to remember your goodness? In your name, amen.